Good morning. I was saying as I came in that uh, uh, what I hope is that it doesn't thunderstorm until at least 3 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> that'll give us time to have completed our work for the day and uh, move forward. But it certainly is always a pleasure for us here at Prince George's Community College to host such important forums that impact the quality of life for all of the residents here in Prince George's County. I too want to thank County Executive Baker for his leadership and for his understanding that truly we are on the path to greatness. And one way we can get there is to make sure that we work hard to improve the lives of women and children in this county. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank you for your support of Prince George's Community College and the work that we do to transform the lives of students and their families. So thank you and have a great day. Good morning, how is everyone doing? Yes. It's a nice early morning. I okay. want to, uh, first yes. of all, mm -hmm. commend you for yes. taking part in this very important discussion. Uh, I want to also add my uh, thank you for our good partner, Dr. Dukes at Community College. Give a round of applause again. And we have among us artist Hampshire Cowan, who I report to on a daily basis. Right here, <laughs> if we can give a round of applause. I point those two women out because they speak to and exemplify what we should be doing here in Prince George's County. Leader of our community college, leader in the community, artists helping shape our education and helping to advise people like myself who are coming into government trying to make a difference. They are the path setters that we want our young women to emulate and to, and to follow. I'm indeed, you know, blessed to have many people on my staff who also are shiny lights. LaVon Thomas, who helps lead our effort in community outreach. Say hi, LaVon. <laughs> and Nina Smith, who is a rising star in Maryland from our staff. And it is indeed a pleasure to have young people with us. I've watched this student uh, grow up, actually probably from first grade, I think it was, and now she's in college and doing a great job. Jennifer Avalar, if you can stand up. Um, Give her a big round of applause. And what's so special about Jennifer is not only is she smart, accomplished, and is really going to make a headway here in Prince George's County, but she's done something I could not do and that is to wake up my middle child, my baby, and convince her she should go with daddy to this event because it's very important. And so I'm so happy to have Asia Baker with us. <laughs> I say these things not in jest, but in seriousness. This administration, I think, has set a tone and that is, if you look at the number of appointments that I have made, and you look at the people who are in them, most of them are women. <laughs> I wish I could say that was on purpose, <laughs> but it wasn't. As we, as we looked down and decided who were in the best position to help lead this county, to help shape the future of Prince George's County, not for the next four years, but for the next 20 and beyond, it just so happened, just so happened that the most qualified, the best people, happen to be women. Now, we could easily say that means that we really don't need this dialogue today. That clearly if the county attorney, if the head of park and planning, the head of social services, family services, my chief of staff, and we could go on, our women, then we have made great strides. But what we're going to learn today in this report is that we have a lot further to go, especially as we're talking about African American women and Latino women, that we have a long way to go in making sure that our young women and our girls understand that we need them. We need them to continue their education. 
We need to make sure that there are examples like we see here in this room today, examples like the chair of our council, who just sat down over here. Good example. <laughs> Not only can you go to college, but you can go to the Naval Academy. You can go to law school. You can have a career. You can enter politics. Those are the things that I want my daughters. So I'm, it's very selfish that I'm here. And I'm willing to admit it. Because one, the women in our household outnumber the men. As, and believe me, my son is unwilling to be on my side when... <laughs> <laughs> He's smart, yes. <laughs> I'm also very much convinced that my middle child will be in charge of me when I am older. <laughs> but it is for a very selfish reason that I am here. And it's because we have to begin this dialogue today and figure out today, not tomorrow, not five days from now, not next year, but today, begin the dialogue. What better place to begin that dialogue than here in Prince George's County? the economic growth for the Washington region. What better place to have that dialogue about how we make sure that our young women, our girls, not just get a BA, but go on to a post-secondary degree because it is important. What better place to have it than here at this community college led by such a great president? What better place? So you have the work before you. It is easy for me to come up here and make the, make the charge to you. The hard work is what you will do in the dialogue that you have this, this morning and this early afternoon. But it's very important. And it is, not light, it, is a, it is not a light charge that you have. It is a heavy one. But that's why we have turned to women to answer it. Thank you. So all of the data I'm going to, or most of the data I'm going to present to you this morning are from our report, a portrait, 2010 portrait of women and girls in the Washington metropolitan area. Um, the, re the report covered a range of topics, which you can see all on the screen, economic security and poverty, education and training, housing, health and well-being. The highlighted ones are the ones I'm going to spend the most time on this morning in the interest of time. Um, I'll say a few words about the others when we get to them, but, um, but I'm mostly going to spend time on that. So before I start on going through the data, I, wanted, I do want to have a, tell you a couple of data notes. One is that most of the data is from 2008 and some of it is from 2009, so it doesn't cover the depth of the recession and it doesn't cover whatever it is we're calling this period that we're in right now. I'm not, sh I'm not sure what to call it actually, yes. So um, all of the data is from, oops, excuse me. most of the data is from a quantitative analysis of the American Community Survey and a few other data sources which are noted in the slides as well as in the report. A review of some published literature. Um, we, we worked with the Girl Scout Council of the Nation's Capital to do some focus groups with young women. And also, um, we worked with Trinity University in Washington um, to do some interviews and focus groups with their students. Um, finally, on the methods, I also want to add that the data was, almost all of the data was crunched for us in partnership with the Urban Institute and with the Institute for Women's Policy Research. When I talk about our region, I want to be clear, this is how the Washington Area Women's Foundation defines our region. So it's District of Columbia, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Arlington County, Fairfax County, and the City of Alexandria. Um, we, I'll, I'll present some information about the region and, and compare it to the US, but then also I'm going to pull out for you some of the Prince George's data where it's available. So demographics. As you can see here, women and girls in the Washington region are more likely to be women of color in comparison with the nation as a whole, so 56% versus 34%. You can see the um, long red line, the longest red line in Prince George's County. About two-thirds of the women here are African American, which is the largest percentage in any jurisdiction in the region. 
The last um, eight to 10 years have seen a dramatic growth in the immigrant population. Um, um, Prince George's here had the highest growth. You can see the, long, the longest red line is 29%, which is Prince George's County. And overall in the region, we had a 21% increase. In income, and this is in the paper a little bit this morning, there's an article about um, McLean and Great Falls, but um, women in this region have higher median incomes than the U.S. overall. Um, you can see in the United States, median income for women in 2008 was $36,361. In our region, in our region, it was higher. And um, you can see, though, that in Prince George's, it's the lowest in the region. In every jurisdiction, it's higher than the national average, but you can see in Prince George's is the lowest in the region at 49,249. Um, while this is higher than the national average overall, it's still less than women need, particularly women raising children, um, what they need to earn to support themselves and their families, and I'll show a slide about that in a couple of minutes. I want to say next a word about poverty. So you can see poverty rates went down slightly from 2000 to 2008, but then they were up again in 2009 um, and slightly, slightly in Prince George's. And as I said, I expect that we expect uh, these percents to go up in 2010 based on the um, data from the recession. We'll know in September, we will be updating these numbers in September when the Census Bureau releases the poverty numbers. Um, the other thing I want to point out here, which is not on the slide but is in the report, is that um, in, in 2009, 177,000 women and girls in our region were below the federal poverty level, which was a 16% increase over 2008. You can see here the good news in this county, though, is that Prince George's had nearly the lowest female poverty rate in the region in 2009. It was only 7.3% um, compared to 16% U.S. and 9% in the region. But again, that could change when the new numbers come out. Women-headed families remain the most vulnerable economically in our region. 11% 11 11 of women-headed families in Prince George's County were living in poverty in 2008. Um, this is higher than what we just saw overall for women of 7.3%. Um, it's also interesting to note that Prince George's County has the largest number of female-headed families, just more than 37,000. Only D.C. is higher, higher here in Prince George's. So I alluded to this data before. You can see uh, this slide just is, is showing that the, federal, the, the differences between the federal poverty line, median income for a woman-headed family in Prince George's County, and then um, the self-sufficiency standard for Prince George's County for an uh, adult with one infant and pre one preschooler. Um, so you can see the federal poverty line is 18, around 18,000. Self-sufficient, um, I'm sorry, median income for a woman-headed family is around $42,000. And then actually what a woman-headed family with an adult and one uh, infant and preschooler needs to meet basic economic security standard is, 76, is nearly 77,000, so that's basically twice. And the, um, I want to say the basic economic sufficiency standard is from... Uh, work from the wider opportunity for, from uh, wider opportunities from for women, and it measures how much it costs to meet a base a family's basic needs, including the need for savings for education and retirement. Um, it's robust, and it's just been they've just released the most recent data this year. Um, I want to say a little bit about education, and it's very important um, at a community college, obviously, to be talking about education and post-secondary education, as community colleges are such a part of the solution um, when we're talking about this. Um, women in our region are almost twice as likely to be college educated as women overall in the U.S., um, um, but unfortunately, the story in Prince George's County doesn't follow this trend. So I'll put that data up. There just are, there's just no other way to say it, but, there, but too many women in our county, in this county, have no post-secondary education. 40% of women, and that's 40% of women in Prince George's County, who have no post-secondary education, which means they're poorly positioned to compete in a regional labor market that's increasingly high, uh, characterized by higher, higher skilled jobs. Um, to give you some data on that, Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce just released a report. Um, this, uh, this summer, actually, that projected that two-thirds of the jobs in this state, 66% in Maryland, would require post-secondary education in 2018. 
Um, in DC, it's actually 71%, and Virginia, it's 64%. Um, and I'm guessing, I would guess, based on what we know about um, the state, that actually in the, inside the Beltway, it's probably higher than, th those numbers are probably higher. So, um, so in, again, I just wanna say, um, I just worry about how well women and girls in this county are positioned to compete in our labor market. Um, and of course, within that, as the county executive sort of um, alluded to, um, African American women and Latinas are even less likely to have post secondary education. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think I have these data for Prince George's. I don't think they're available, but that would be a good maybe thing to look into and talk about um, afterwards. And we know that, um, and the reason I'm spending time on this as well, is we know that um, education and training are highly related to income um, and earnings. And so this is, um, that for this slide we see that with similar levels of education and training, women's average earnings still lag behind men's. Um, women with a graduate degree are earning $70,000 a year, um, compared to women who have not gradu graduated from high school who are earning just $18,000. So there's a great grad gradation obviously education related to income, um, but there's still a lag between men and women. So you can see, um, you can see from this that even that um, women with some college, that, that, <laughs> let me back, so women with a bachelor's degree earn $51,000, um, which is about what men with some college or an associate's degree earn. So um, there's something we need to talk about as well. Um, and again, this is probably not a big surprise, but these are the data that white men out earn women of all races and ethnicities. Overall, I'll say overall in our region, women earn 20% less than men, um, but this is further exacerbated when you break the data down by race and ethnicity. So you can see here that African American women working full time make 45% less than white women, I'm sorry, than white men in our region working full time. So I did break this down, um, these earnings differences by gender and race in Prince George's County, and they're pretty interesting. White men make the most, but not by much. Um, only about 5% more than African American women. White women make less than white men and less than African American women and men, but Latinas are far behind, with Latinas making 52% less than African American women and about half of what white women are making. I want to say a word about unemployment, and again, with the caveat that this is data from 2008, so it probably looks slightly different, probably worse right now. Um, unemployment rates were highest among Latinas and African American women in 2008 in our region. Um, in Prince George's County, 12% of Latinas were unemployed, followed by 7% of Asians, Asian women and 6% of African American women. Um, one interesting thing to note in our region is that unlike the nation, men and women have similar rates of unemployment. So in, normal, in, the, in, the, re, in the nation as a whole, um, men have higher unemployment, but in our region that's not the case. So I wanna say a few things about work supports and other um, expenses for women, and particularly women-headed families. So childcare is something probably everyone knows in this room knows a little bit about. But I'll say in Maryland, the cost of full-time care for an infant in a, in a center is 34% of a female-headed household's median income. Um, you can see in DC it's half. Um, so the story in Maryland's a little better, but it's not great. A third of your income has to go to um, child care. At the same time, women working in um, the child care sector are among the working poor. So in Maryland, the median earnings of a child care provider is just $22,000 a year. So it's unlikely they can really afford to have their children in care while they're working. Then when you add the cost of housing on top of that, um, we see that 66% of female-headed families with children in this county are living in unaffordable housing, which means that they're paying at least 30% of their income toward their housing. So when you add, in, when you add housing and childcare, you basically got nothing left. So I do want to say a few things about our health and health, what, some of our findings around health and safety, um, but I want to say, make a couple of observations before I share the data with you. Um, much of it's older than American Community Survey data, so older than 2008. Much of it's available, or what we could find was available by 
state or, and not by jurisdiction. So um, again, there's the issue of how representative is state data to what's going on in this county or Montgomery County even. I, I, don't, I can't really answer that. Um, much of the jurisdictional data, even when it's available, is not available by gender. And then um, that safety data is not the same as crime data, and crime data is not the same as safety data. They're, they're different. They're related, but they're different things. So Latinas have the lowest level of health insurance coverage in the region. Um, only 69% of Latinas in Prince George's County have health coverage compared to 93% of white women and 89% of African American women. Um, of course, we know also that having health insurance is not the same as having access to quality care services and when you need it. Given the demographics of the county, I wanted to say a few things about um, um, the, the burden of disease burden on women of color. Um, it's um, pretty um, well documented that um, there's a higher disease burden on women of color for a variety of reasons. Um, social determinants of health, other economic issues, um, but you know we see higher rates of cancer mortality, particularly breast cancer. I'll say something about that in Prince George's in a minute. Higher rates of obesity, higher teen birth rates, higher rates of infant mortality, etc. Um, one example that I looked at, um, and this is 2009 data from the Prince George's County Health Department. Um, HIV was the third leading cause of death for African American women in Maryland in 2009. It was 10% of deaths. It didn't even make the list for white women. Um, according to the Prince George's County Health Department, more than 2,000 women were living with HIV in the county in 2009. Um, the vast majority African American. So these, this is a, like I said, I was going to show a slide on breast cancer. Um, again, this is, from, this is from the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. This is 2009 data. You can see that white women have higher incidence of breast cancer, um, and African American women have higher mortality from breast cancer. So, um, you know, something going on there. <laughs> Not sure what. Would welcome thoughts about that. Finally, I wanted to say a couple things about violence and safety before I turn it over to questions and answers, hopefully answers. Um, so uh, I, I feel like this is a very understudied area that I'm interested in knowing more about and we couldn't find out a lot about, but violence threatens the safety and well-being of women and girls and it, it, it prevents them from doing all the things they need to do in their lives. It affects their safety at home, their safety getting to work, getting to education. Um, in Maryland, intentional violence, so that's homicide and suicide, accounted for one quarter of deaths for African American girls and women in 2009 be between the ages of 15 and 24. Um, and then in our region, this is, uh, this is something about the service gap. In one day alone in fall 2009, domestic violence programs were forced to turn, ra turn away almost 600 victims in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia due, due to insufficient capacity to serve clients who are showing up in the at their doors. So I know that was a lot of data I just threw at you, and it's not in front of you in uh, paper format. It is in the report, obviously, but um, so I want to say here, so given what we've just heard, what needs to happen to improve the economic security of women and girls in Prince George's County? Um, you know, as I said at the beginning, as we share this data in the community, and I, I actually think this is going to be the last time we have this report out in the community in this kind of forum, recognizing the data is getting old, that there's lots of new data coming out, thinking about how we're going to update this data to serve our region and the jurisdictions in our region the best way we can. Um, we're always interested at looking at community solutions to improve um, the lives of economically vulnerable women and girls in our region. Um, engage in dialogue with you, which we hope will, will go much beyond today. Um, we look forward very much to hearing your thoughts and then hearing about how we can be most helpful here today and in the future. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Um, my question to you, especially while we have our distinguished county exec and all of our lovely council people here, 
one of the things as a community activist, we're always fighting for more jobs, more more businesses to come in, more government business, more business. And I looked at your chart. In Virginia, the problem, I mean, one of the reasons why they're making more money, they have businesses. You can go in Virginia, my kids see jobs all the time. But in Prince George's County, and, I'm, I'm, and I guess I'm answering my question, one of the things, we don't have jobs. We don't have large businesses. We don't have corp, um, large corporations. And that's why our income is low here. And that's one of the reasons why we're not making the money that we should be making, because there are no businesses here for our kids to get jobs. Even when they graduate from college, just, they're looking for jobs, but where are the large businesses? Where are the federal governments? They're not here in our county for us to be able to make that money. Say that I know, uh, I know how motivated many people are in this county to get training and get work. I mean, you know, I meet with service providers all over the region, and come to find out a very um, strong program I know about in Arlington. You know, people said people are never going to come to Arlington to get this training, and meanwhile, like half their Half their, um, half their learning communities now are, are from Prince George's County. People make this commitment to, to the travel, to their future, right? And, um, and people in this county, I know if you look, I think, I feel comp pretty confident saying this, if you look at the data about how far people travel to work, probably people in this county travel the furthest. So there is the desire and the wherewithal. And so I, I think, I think that that is a, you know, point worth talking about in our discussions. The fact that the farther back you defer the first child when, uh, when a woman uh, has a family, um, the education tie to that and then the income tie to that as well. I think one of the challenges today with everybody in, in this room perhaps would be to look at how the, the county is going to deliver family planning type services to younger women and girls um, in order to push that level of education up and help the income to rise in the context of federal spending is going away and we're going to have to look to ourselves and our organizations to help facilitate the delivery. And uh, I would hope that people are discussing that topic today. And my question uh, piggybacked on some of the things that have been said about how you disaggregate the data so that you show the boomer generation, the Gen X, and uh, other generations and how they are doing in parallel tracks because we're finding that poverty stays tracked, wealth stays tracked, and in order to break that cycle, uh, we need the data to show where we're getting the information from. If 83.2% of women living in DC housing projects are single heads of household, and a lot of those women who've moved to Prince George's County um, are being now counted here because uh, housing was more affordable here but we don't have that data. And so sometimes in order to collaborate and do something about it, we need the data to reflect what we're seeing. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add one thing, which is the Census Bureau is here, like in your backyard. I think it's in Suitland, right? So, yeah, yeah so reach out. But of course, that's not the only answer. I mean, um, but I, I just wanted to, I just remembered that I wanted to add that. Um, my comment is that in looking or gleaning this information, it is. It's quite um, comprehensive, I'm sure, in content. I have not read it. But one of the things that I'm concerned about is I am concerned about with my clients and with other people that I associate and work with is the mental health of women. Uh, women who head households, I have young clients that have many children who cannot afford uh, attorneys and all of that. But I'm also concerned about the women that have children with disabilities and why we are not representing the status of children when we talk about education. I deal with post-secondary placements all of the time. And so I am very concerned that as we prepare reports like this, it's a wonderful report, but as we begin to build and when we start, start talking about data analysis, one has to look at the small effects that are within groups. That is where you glean your most important information. So I just wanted to share with you that even though we have this and we have all of these wonderful statistics, 
the practical application of everyday living for young women, middle-aged women, and older women who have to take and assume the responsibility of a parent when they have already raised their children. The issues of inflated um, incomes or lack thereof and their children who don't have the motivation once they come out of our schools. And then what is happening within our schools that do not have the effect to want a child to move on to go to higher levels of learning and accomplishment. And we have a lot of things that may be uh, reported in these types of reports, but we need to translate whatever the data is. It is not too far off from the reality of what we are experiencing every day. And I think we just need to roll our, roll our sleeves up and start working in an institutional kind of setting for young girls when we recognize that they are at risk. My research, my dissertation research is on at-risk children. I did my research in DC and I'm born and raised in DC. The only point I'm trying to make is until you apply the things that we are getting from this valuable information on piloting or very small uh, programs so that we can translate this in and begin to remove the generational uh, issues that have plagued the African American community, in particular the head of households. Black women have an issue with mental health. They don't get the support and when they beg and plead for it, sometimes they don't even get it at that point. So we do have some resources, and thank God we have those kinds of things. But for our children, and for the children particularly, who I love very much, are the disabled, and I'm concerned about the mental health for all of them. Thank you. I just wanted thank to you. comment on that. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think that, um, I, I mean, I think that a multi -gen as you're saying, a multi-generational approach is critical, and a comprehensive, multi-faceted multi approach is also um, needed where we talk about education and, and assets and housing and health and I'll tell you we tried very hard to get more health data and it just was very very challenging within our budget and our time constraints and our yes and what we could and yeah and, and we are at the Women's Foundation very interested in hearing um, what else should be in our research agenda moving forward and I think we're very very interested and have had several sessions like these with providers working with girls and providers um, and the girls themselves and providers and women in the older part of the lifespan as well recognizing that it's a multi-generational um, issue and and so I welcome that conversation later today um, about 60 percent of Prince George's County's working population leaves the county to go to work every day and so it's very hard to have living wage jobs that allow women to uh, especially single women to um, sustain themselves and their families. So that's a systemic problem. And when I talk to economic development officials, the response is always um, that it's a multifaceted systemic set of issues, that we can't get large businesses because we have poor education, or we can't get them because we have crime, or we can't get them because of something else. When do we start and what are we going to start? Because it has to start somewhere. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is that you talked about um, a region divided. We also have a county divided. And so we have an inside the beltway and an outside of the beltway in Prince George's County. And that sometimes skews a lot of the responses and results that you get because 17 inner beltway communities are far below the federal poverty level. Whereas if you go outside the county, we're the wealthiest county in the nation, wealthiest minority um, county in the nation. So we really need to work on programs that really help families with pathways out of poverty. And I wanted to talk about the fact that I have this youth leadership program with at-risk youth. And in seven years, 100% of our kids have graduated on time, applied to college, gotten scholarships to college, and gone to college and these are kids who never thought college was an option and what we have taught them is that the poorer you are the more opportunities there are to go to college because there's money but their parents don't know that so somehow we have to have holistic programs that let people know there is a way out this is not your destiny there are choices you can make that's my comments thank yeah. you I'm very I'm very um, <laughs> thank you Kim I'm very struck um, just the, the longer I'm at the Women's Foundation the more, and working in the region, the more I'm struck about how um, geographic barriers like the Beltway here or like 
the Anacostia River in DC, how they're emotional barriers and they're not entirely, um, they are geographic barriers but they're also emotional and intellectual barriers and I think it's very deep and I'm not sure how we, how we carry people across. Yeah. We need to address the issue of health. In Prince George's County, there are 160,000 uninsured people who utilize the emergency room for their health care. When people do that, they cannot get preventive health care. They cannot get education they need to take care of themselves. Because emergency medicine is urgent medicine, something that happens now, it's something that you need to take care of now. And even if it's taken care of then, they need to follow up. They have nowhere to follow up because they don't have insurance. Or they don't have a facility to go to. There aren't enough community health centers. There's only one in Prince George's County. As opposed to look at Baltimore City down the road where there are 130,000 uninsured people. There are eight community health centers serving Baltimore City. We have one in Prince George's County to serve 160,000. We need to do something about this. And let me tell you one more thing. Why don't you have it? Why don't we have more community health centers here? We need at least eight, maybe 10, to serve this population. The reason we don't have it is because when you look at the average income in Prince George's County, as somebody rightly pointed out there, it's about $70,000. The federal government approves community health centers for way less income. They approve community health centers based on low income. Prince George's County makes too much. It is not true. Where are these stats from? A few people make over $70,000, but most of the population don't. Now, if we can get the federal government to look at disease entities as another reason to approve community health centers, guess what? Prince George's County will be approved for more community health centers. So we need to get together to address this at the federal level. I'm happy that we have Senator Mikulski's representative here this morning. We need the federal government to add disease entities to approve approving community health centers. And our foundation, for instance, Global Vision Foundation, and some other people in Prince George's County, our council chair, for instance, have been working on getting this done. So we need help. We need to address this from the federal level so that we can find solutions to our health issues here. Thank you. Residents who have a history here across generations and those who have arrived since roughly 1972 to 79. There is a difference. I am one of the old residents. Um, I am a first generation Prince Georgian, but I had connectivity to those who go back 150, 200 years. So I think it would help you to look at why you're getting data. And as a member of the Board of Ed, because of this, we serve the entire county, and it is how we have to do our work and how we are working to have a college-going culture in Prince George's, but how do we deliver that message across the county? So I will be taking your data uh, and uh, sharing it with the superintendent and the board, and I thank you very much. Thank you. The Family Services in the Maryland Park provide statistical information for those that were inquiring. And I know they do studies on disproportionate minority representation and child well-being, and they have a, a multitude of information that would help you to form helpful government, private health organizations. Prince George's County is full. It's just full of all kinds of services and uh, assistance programs. And we have in the police department what we call 
community policing. I need that our first, I think our first step should be community government where we collaborate more, learn who is where and what they have to offer. And I am representing two separate entities. As manager of Cole Stevens Salon and Day Spa, we are a small business where we have hired uh, people who are just coming out of salon school and we have taken people who have had to leave their jobs for whatever reason and have come to Cole Stevens. My question regarding Cole Stevens is, are there any funding, any programs available for a small business who wishes to expand and hire some of these women who are seeking positions? Most of these women have families. A lot of them are single family uh, parents. So we are in the position where we have hired and we are expanding, but we want to know what type of funding is available should we be able to expand more and get some of our women into the workforce. My I would okay. encourage you to connect with um, some nonprofits in the community that can use government f funding, whether it's federal or state or local funding, to help with that process. There are a variety of funding streams that do support that. Um, I don't know a lot about how they are working here, how well they are working here, but I don't know, maybe Kim, Kim can speak to some of that, not to put you on the spot right now. Um, and in turn, so, but, and I'm sure there are, um, you know, whether it's through WIA or whether it's through TANF or I don't know what the county policies are around all of that. Um, in terms of for support for nonprofit, I, um, I, can um, maybe connect you with some other people here in the room, also putting them on the spot. But Desiree from the Community Foundation of Prince George's, my colleague Nicole Kozier from the Women's Foundation, we do support some work around, currently around girls, and we'll be um, thinking about how to expand that moving forward. Um, and I would just encourage you to connect with peers as well. Um, where you can collaborate to build something um, bigger than yourself. And then the other, um, I don't know if there's anyone here today from the Human Services Coalition of Prince George's, but they did, ha they did, yes, oh good. Hi. <laughs> they are a grantee partner of ours, and I know they've gotten, they have done some work around incub incubators and supporting and providing capacity building, capacity building for nonprofits in the community as well. So I think there are some, resources here, I just, I don't know exactly how they're working here, so. But there are other people luckily here today who do. Um, 